just get right into the word, amen, and pray that, uh, you know, I don't believe that there's any accidents, amen, so I don't think that there's anybody that's here by accident, amen, I don't believe that I'm standing here by accident and there's nobody here under the sound of my voice that's here by accident, so I believe that there's something prayerfully in this word that's here for somebody, amen, and, and prayerfully that everybody can get something out of this word, and so I pray that uh, you don't miss what God has for you on today. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us all here, Heavenly Father, Lord. We know we've all had our own journeys and our ups and downs, Heavenly Father, that have brought us to this moment. So we thank you for this moment, Lord. We thank you for your presence here. And Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would uh, speak through this, your prophet, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would flow, amen, fill me up with your power, Heavenly Father, speak through my voice, Lord, accomplish what it is that you would want to accomplish on today, Heavenly Father, Lord, and uh, that everybody here would be blessed, Heavenly Father, Lord, and that your word would, uh, that it would go forth, Heavenly Father, Lord, and that it would not return void, Lord, but it, it would accomplish whatever it is that your purpose is, Heavenly Father, these blessings we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, our text on today, amen, is coming out of the book of Luke. Amen. The book of Luke, the gospel of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 2, beginning at verse 8 and reading through uh, verse 20. And I would ask, if you're able, that you would um, stand for the reading of God's word, if you're able. I'm going to be reading it from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but whatever version that you have, amen, God's Word is God's, God's Word. We know that technically it was originally written in the Greek, so any translation that we have in English is technically just a translation, amen, but I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Amen. If you found it, please say amen. Amen. Beginning at verse 8, it reads thusly, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Please turn to your neighbor and give them my sermon title. Don't miss it. Please turn to your other neighbor and tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, don't miss it. It was perhaps the biggest marketing challenge that the world had ever seen. More than 200, 2,000 years after God had first started making promises about the long-awaited Messiah, the Anointed One, that God was going to send to save his people and be a blessing to all the families of the earth, and that was in Genesis 12:3. now it was finally time for him to come. 
the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was about to be born in a small town called Bethlehem as the firstborn child of a virgin named Mary who was engaged to a man named Joseph. And he wasn't going to be born in a palace. No, he was about to be delivered in a stable where they kept the animals and laid in a manger, a feeding trough, because there was no room for his family in the inn. But how was God going to let the Jewish people know that after all of these thousands of years of waiting, the Messiah had finally come? Well, nowadays, we might sit down and develop an entire rollout plan. You know, do I have any marketing people in the audience? Amen. Uh, you know, they might include things like e-cards, maybe get some professional photography, some Internet websites, hashtags, Facebook posts, text messages, tweets, press releases, you know, maybe some little tattoos, you know, uh, you know, maybe do some breaking news, television interviews, billboards, you know. Um, but unfortunately, none of those things were available in first century biblical Palestine. So instead, God had to develop his own marketing plan that involved, wait for it, shepherds. Amen. Okay, but before we get into our main text more deeply, we first have to deal with the elephant that's in the room, because I know I got some biblical scholars in the room, and, and somebody in here is thinking in their own mind, why are we talking about the shepherds going to see baby Jesus in the manger on Palm Sunday? All right? Well, let's take a moment and look at Luke 19, starting at verse 29. It reads like this in the New Revised Standard Version. You can also turn to it if you want. Um, Luke 19, starting at verse 29. When he had come near Bethphage at Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been written, ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this. The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And, you know, they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, the people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And that was verse 42. I'm going to skip to the end of verse 44. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Okay, and so basically this is a, a passage, the, the piece about the weeping, the last part of the text about the triumphal entry in which Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. That's something you only find in Luke. It's not in Matthew. It's not in Mark. Um, but in that text, Jesus was basically weeping because he knew that in spite of everything that he had already done during his three years of earthly ministry, okay, in spite of all of the healing of the sick, in spite of all of the teaching that he had done, you know, he had been all over, you know, Jerusalem and, and all over, you know, in the different cities and towns and in the villages doing all of these miracles, you know, trying to show and, you know, communicate to the people that he was the Messiah, you know, that they had been waiting for and, you know, trying to communicate to him what his purpose was and all of that in spite of everything that he had done and also in spite of what he knew that he was about to do, okay? You know, he was coming into Jerusalem for what we refer to as Passion Week, and he already knew what was about to go down, okay? And he knew that in spite of all of that, you know, and in spite of the fact that they were all crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, he knew that many of the good church folk in Jerusalem, many of these Israelites, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, you know, and, and many of us now, we want to sit back and judge them, but they would have been who we are today, right? They would have been the faithful church folk who had been sitting around in church every Sunday, and they had been reading the Old Testament, and they knew the Messiah was coming, and they were waiting for the Messiah, you know, and the Messiah was right here in front of them. 
and they did not recognize the Messiah, you know, and so he was weeping because of that. All that I have done, you know, if you look in Luke, many of the times when Jesus was doing all of his miracles, these folk, the Jews, they were right there observing it. But then they'd look at each other and say, hmm, he has a demon. You know what I'm saying? And so that's kind of what this is, you know, so that's what this sermon is getting at. Don't miss it. You know, how is it that you can be a church person in church all the time? Jesus is right in front of you, and somehow it goes over your head, and you miss it, okay? And so I would argue that there's something that we can learn, perhaps, if we go back to the beginning of the situation and look at the shepherds, because the shepherds didn't miss it. So maybe we can learn something from the shepherds that might help us, you know, now, because I would argue that even today sometimes we as church folk can miss Jesus when he's standing in front of us in our situations as well. Amen. So that's why we're talking about shepherds on, on Palm Sunday. Amen. All right. So, you know, as we said, you know, it's possible to grow up in church, you know, come in and out of church every Sunday, and even serve in ministries and positions in the church and still miss God. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we want to try to make sure that that doesn't happen to us. Amen. Um, you know, you can miss uh, what God is doing, and sometimes you can miss what God wants you to do if you're not paying the right kind of attention. Amen, right? So you can be there, and you can call yourself paying attention. You can be in the room, but if you're not paying the right kind of attention, um, you can miss it. And so um, that's kind of, uh, you know, the story of how God uses the shepherds to help announce the birth of Jesus, I think, lifts some points. You know, because basically God looked at them and said, out of all the people in, in, you know, in Jerusalem, out of all the people in Nazareth, out of all the people, you know, in, in Bethlehem, you know, these are the ones that I want to have be the first ones to announce the birth of Jesus. So what's it about these shepherds that made them the ones that God chose to use as opposed to somebody else? So don't miss it. Let's kind of take a closer look at these shepherds. All right. So at the time of our text, the Jewish people were living under Roman oppression, under the rulership of the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. And, you know, they were under heavy taxation. That's really why Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem at that time anyway, because uh, Augustus Caesar had demanded a census so that he could count all the people, because if he wanted to tax them, he had to be able to count them all. So he had to make them go back to their place of birth, you know, for their family so he could count them all. And so they were in Bethlehem to register so that he could tax them more effectively, right? Okay. Um, and they were upset, obviously, because, you know, having previously been independent, now they were under the control of this Roman government. Um, in the meantime, um, what's interesting is although shepherding had been a noble profession in the past, you know, if you go back to the days of Abraham and Isaac and whatnot, all of them were shepherds. But at the time of Jesus, shepherding is no longer viewed as a noble profession, you know, because at this point in time, they're more kind of settled in a more agricultural environment um, where people are farmers and they have these little villages and cities and shepherds were viewed kind of as, they viewed them as lazy because the shepherds were more types of people that kind of had the flocks that went and they would kind of, you know, kind of go from place to place and they would kind of, you know, nibble, you know, they'd go and nibble here and then they'd move them and nibble there. And so the people who owned the land felt like the shepherds were coming on their land and eating, you know, and it's kind of like you're infringing upon my property kind of situation. So, you know, the, the rabbis actually had, um, there was something that said that some of the rabbis in Jesus' time actually would talk amongst themselves and say, you know, I don't understand this 23rd Psalm. Why, why would, you know, why would the 23rd Psalm say the Lord is my shepherd, you know, because, you know, these shepherds are really shiftless creatures. So, you know, this was kind of just how their little mentality was. They really were really twisted in their thinking, you know, even though back in the day, you know, shepherds had been really um, revered. And so at this time, not only is God coming to shepherds, but he's actually coming to people who really were viewed as outcasts, you know, and having them be the ones that are going to be um, coming to announce uh, Jesus' birth. Um, they were also viewed as being ceremonially unclean by the religious establishment. That was kind of like a big thing, you know, that you couldn't come into the temple, you know, if you were unclean, you know, like, you know, and being clean, like, you know, you had to, 
you know, follow certain specific religious procedures. So if you hadn't, you know, followed those procedures, then you couldn't come inside of the temple. And so shepherds, because of their profession, I guess, because they were out there with the animals and the things that they had to do, it was difficult for them to meet those standards. And so, you know, they, they were just looked down upon by the establishment. Um, so again, they would be the last persons one would expect to receive a visit from the angels. Um, but that's who God chose, okay? Um, so again, what can we learn from the shepherds that so many of the other Israelites missed? Um, the first thing that I think we can learn from the shepherds is that, uh, first, you don't want to miss the significance of what is happening around you. You know, again, you know, these other Jewish people, they were there, they saw the stuff happening, but some kind of way they missed the significance of it. Even though it was happening right before their eyes, somehow they were misinterpreting stuff and they didn't really get what was happening. Um, if we look at verse 8, um, we see that the shepherds, um, you know, were where they were supposed to be because, you know, first of all, in order to know what's happening, you've got to be there, right? There's some folk who aren't at church today, so how are they going to know what's happening unless maybe somebody shares it with them on Facebook or, you know, pastor does, you know, give people, you know, next week they'll get the, the sermon so they can listen to it after the fact. So we, you know, we help a brother out, we help a sister out so they can know what's happening. But, you know, technically you need to physically be in the place to know what happened, right? I guess sometimes we got some folk that also gossip, right? So somebody might, you know, call somebody on the phone and say, yo, you know, this is what happened. But, you know, the shepherds were where they were supposed to be. Like if the angel had come to the field where the shepherds were supposed to be and the shepherds weren't there, they would have missed it, right? But, you know, the shepherds were actually in the field with their flocks where they were supposed to be, and that's part of, you know, why they didn't miss it. They were, they were where they were supposed to be in the fields near Bethlehem. Um, and not only that, they were awake, you know. Um, you know, it was at night. These were flocks that they were supposed to be keeping an eye on because they're sheep. And, um, you know, their job was to make sure at night that the jackals and the hyenas and the wolves and whatnot didn't get to the sheep, you know. Um, and so, you know, that was their job. That was their J-O-B. So, again, if they were asleep, if an angel shows up and you're asleep, the angel might be like, okay, you know, I'm just going on back to heaven, right? But the, the shepherds were awake, so they were able to see, you know, what happened, right? Um, they were taking shifts, supposedly. So some of them slept while some of them were awake or whatever. But that's, that's kind of um, what was going on. So I'm going to show, you know, um, that I'm up with pop culture, you know. In the words of a popular song by Childish Gambino, they knew they had to stay woke, because they'd be creeping, okay? They knew the jackals, the wolves, and the other predators have a permanent agenda. And just because you don't see them doesn't mean they aren't lurking and waiting for an opportune moment to attack. So the shepherds didn't allow themselves to be distracted from that primary responsibility of protecting the sheep that were in their care. Because sheep, they don't have any defensive, you know, mechanisms. They're just there, and, you know, they're totally dependent on you to protect them. And, you know, there's some other situations that are parallel to that where, you know, sometimes we also have people that are in our care. And so, you know, I would just want to lift up parents. You know, you can't just leave your children in the care of just anybody for convenience, you know, regardless of whether they're your relative, a neighbor, boyfriend, girlfriend, even a volunteer from school, church, or a community organization. You know, the more I read in the news about these different people, that turn out to be predators and, you know, you can't always tell who's who. You know, you can look at somebody and you can say to yourself, well, I would have never thought that this person would be doing X, Y, or Z, right? You can't always tell, okay? Um, and so First Peter 5.8 says that the enemy roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So stay woke. Don't miss it. And make sure you pay attention to any unusual changes in your children's behavior. Uh, but not only weren't the, were, were the, children's phys, uh, the shepherds physically present, and they were doing what they were supposed to do, they were watching, they were awake, um, but they were also fully mentally aware of what was going on around them. You know, because sometimes you can be kind of in the room, but still not really fully engaged in the situation. Okay? For example, they weren't partaking of any recreational or mind-altering substances. Uh-huh. In other words, they weren't getting high. Uh, as a result, after the angel and the heavenly host came and left, they didn't think that they had just experienced some sort of dream or hallucination, okay? Because if that had happened, again, 
the angels could have come and this whole wonderful situation could have happened and they could have been just been like, wow, man, that was really wild. Oh, you know, and they, they still could have just totally missed it. They could have just thought, hey, that was really deep and, ooh, you know, and not done anything. Okay. But instead, they realized they had a spiritually significant encounter that required a response. Um, now, let me just pause parenthetically to say that although I don't know personally, experientially, what happens when you get high, I do remember there was a song that was out back in the day in which an artist named Afro Man talked about all the bad things which he said had happened in his life, quote unquote, because I got high. In fact, some of the biggest stars that I grew up with are no longer with us because of drugs and drug addiction. People like Michael Jackson, Prince, and Whitney Houston. And I keep on hearing about things in the news, even about some of the younger artists that things happen to. Um, but on a more serious tip, um, I once heard a preacher, Reverend James Perkins, say that there's some trouble that you can't avoid just because you are a black person. Sometimes just because of the color of your skin, you are at risk of having people decide that you quote unquote fit the profile and then they just treat you like a criminal even though you didn't do anything. But there's also some trouble that we can choose that makes matters worse for us as black people. Don't get it twisted. There are people who are building bigger and bigger prisons and they are looking for any excuse to lock up people who look like you and me for the rest of our lives so that we can work for free. And if you choose to get involved with drugs, you're just giving them an excuse, okay? If you, you know, stay woke, look at the news, okay? There's discussions about death penalties and, you know, life sentences and whatever it is that they're talking about relating to drugs, but all of that stuff, it hits us more heavily, you know? So I'm a firm believer that you don't have to experience everything for yourself in order to know what it'll do to you. Instead, you can learn from other people's bad experiences and decide in your own heart to just say no. Don't do it. Put it down while you still can and don't pick it up again. Now, I know it can be easier said than done, but if you want to get delivered, God can help you to get connected to some shepherds who can show you how to get delivered from that lifestyle. And in fact, I believe we even have at least one small group here at East Friendship that can help people who are delivering with, uh, dealing with issues relating to recovery. You know, so again, stay woke. You know, don't miss it, and, you know, if you got a little buddy pal or whatever who's trying to hand you something and say, yo, man, try this, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you don't know if you're the one who is going to get hooked on something and never be able to get off of it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm just saying don't, don't allow somebody to get you into something because, you know, we all are like sheep. The Bible says all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. All of us can be naive. And, you know, you don't want to allow somebody to get you into something that can mess you up for the rest of your life. So that's just something, you know, just throwing it in for free. All right? But, um, you know, shepherds, again, know that sheep can be very nearsighted. They can easily get lured into something that can cause major problems down the line without fully understanding what they're getting themselves into. You know, that was part of what shepherds had to deal with is that sheep, you know, they'd just be kind of nibbling. And then they, like, see another little piece of grass, and they just keep nibbling, and before you know it, they're over here about to fall off the, uh, fall off the cliff, you know. And so one of the things, I didn't know this, because if you remember, David, when he was, you know, going after Goliath, he had a slingshot. Well, I never understood why David had a slingshot in my studies about this sermon. The reason that they had a sling is that they would have a stone, and when a sheep was getting too far off track, they would take the stone and use it and hit it near the sheep to scare the sheep, to get the sheep's attention so the sheep would come on back to the flock, okay? And so, again, there may be somebody in here that God may be trying to take a stone and kind of hit at you and let you know maybe there's something going on in your life where you, you get a little bit out of, out of whack and, you know, maybe it's time to kind of come on back, you know? And, and we need to, you know, don't miss it when God's trying to get your attention. You know, sometimes we get offended, but don't, don't get offended. If God's trying to get your attention about something that's getting a little bit out of whack, listen to God and, you know, come on back into the fold because it's for your own good. Amen? So don't get it. Miss it if God is trying to get your attention in some area of your life. But getting back to our text, I believe the shepherds didn't miss the significance of what was happening, not only because they were physically present, they were doing what they were supposed to do, and they were mentally aware, but they also had a deeper level of perception regarding what was going on around them. 
by nature, they had to be observant. They had to discern things in order to be able to protect and care for their flocks. You know, they had to kind of look at the sheep and count them and, you know, make sure they were okay and all that. And, again, kind of be kind of looking out on the, you know, out on the horizon, make sure that, you know, things were okay. You know, be aware of kind of, you know, where the good pasture was so that they would know kind of, you know, where to take the sheep and things of that nature. And so those skills may have also assisted them in interpreting the significance of the message that they received from the angels. You know, again, although they were viewed as outcasts and unclean, they were Jews just like everybody else, you know. And so they also were aware of the prophecies regarding the Messiah. And so when they heard the angel saying the Messiah had been born in the city of, of David, and they saw the heavenly host of angels, I mean, imagine, you know, if, if the sky just broke out and all of a sudden there's all these angels singing, you know, and praising and all that, and, you know, they looked at that situation and they stepped out on faith and discerned and said, hey, maybe this could be true. And, hey, we, we need to at least go and investigate it. And so that's kind of what they did. They kind of took a leap of faith and said, you know what, we're going to at least go and check it out, okay? Um, and so that's uh, something perhaps that we can learn from the shepherds. Instead of, you know, being like the Jews who basically were like, well, that can't be true. You know, perhaps he has a demon. You know, at least, <laughs> you know, let's, let's take a leap of faith and, and let's go and at least uh, say, hey, maybe it could be true. Let's go and, and keep an open mind about it. Um, verse 15 lets us know, again, that they had the proper response. You know, not only did they say, let us go to Bethlehem, but they said, let us go now to Bethlehem. There was a sense of urgency. They wanted to see this thing which had taken place, which the Lord had made known to them. You know, so again, they recognized this is significant. You know, they, the, the angel came to us. You know, they, they, you know, didn't come over there to those priests, to those rabbis. They, they came to us. This is significant. They recognized this is important. You know, and so they didn't just blow it off. They weren't like, hey, you know, I got a bunch of other stuff on my, my to-do list. You know, I'll, I'll do this next week. I'll do this tomorrow. They decided that night that they would go. And if they had delayed, they might have missed it. Who knows? You know, the Bible doesn't tell us how long Mary and Joseph remained in that barn with the animals and with the child laying in the manger. You know, the sign was, you know, you're going to see the child laying in the manger. But who knows how long they stayed there because maybe – by the next day, maybe there was room in the inn, so maybe the child wasn't in the manger the next night. I don't know how many days the child was laying in that manger. But, you know, we know at least that Matthew's gospel says that by the time the wise men got there, you know, that they were no longer in the manger, they were in a house, you know. Um, the wise men had seen the star that night, but because they were further away, they had a farther distance to travel. But the shepherds were right there, you know, near Bethlehem. They were just kind of up in the hills, so they were able to get there that same night. Um, and so basically, you know, they kind of went, and I don't know how, but, you know, some kind of way they went through Jerusalem and they were able to find a barn and they were able to find, you know, this baby in the manger. And, you know, because they had their priorities in the right place, even though they were working, they still went to see baby Jesus. So that's another question. You know, do we have our priorities in order? Do we have a sense of urgency about the things of God or do we put them on the back burner? You know, can the Lord trust you with a revelation? When the Lord reveals something to you, um, I guess the word would be move on it. Don't miss it. Amen. Um, so I guess my testimony would be, you know, this sermon, I started getting the ideas about this sermon back in January, and I made the mistake of telling Pastor Maxwell about it. Amen. And then Pastor Maxwell went and put me on the calendar. And, <laughs> and you know, it's been a very bu busy season in my life, but, um, you know, I was obedient, right, even though I had a whole lot going on because this is something of God, right? And so, you know, you do have to make a priority for the things of God. Amen. All right. So the first point was, you know, that we, we don't want to miss the significance of what is happening. We want to be present. We want to be aware, you know, and we want to make it a priority. The second point is that the shepherds did not miss the significance of who Jesus is you know, which I think was a problem that the religious establishment had. The shepherds accepted the angel's pronouncement that the baby that had been born was the long-awaited and promised Messiah, Savior, Christ the Lord, and they eagerly went to see him. And they accepted the sign that the angel had given as verification regarding his identity. The angel said, hey, you know, this is who he is, the baby, the Messiah has been born, this is going to be your sign, you're going to see this baby laying in a manger with all the, the swaddling cloths wrapped around him, 
boom, they went, they saw, there's the baby in the manger. They were like, hey, you know, bet, that's it, and they, they ran with it. You know, they didn't have any questions, you know, boom, this must be true because the angel told me, I went, I saw it, it was just as it is, so it must be true. The reason why Jesus wept over Jerusalem was because although the Jewish people were ex expecting the Messiah, you know, many of the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees ultimately rejected him because he wasn't the kind of Messiah that they were respect expecting. So that was their issue. You know, not only are they expecting the Messiah, but I want it to be my kind of Messiah. It needs to be the kind of Messiah that I want. So if God sends me a Messiah, but it's not the kind I want, then, then I have a problem with that. So that was kind of the issue there. You know, um, they wanted a Messiah that was going to help them to overthrow their Roman oppressors, you know. So they wanted like a gladiator type of Messiah, you know. That's what they wanted. And so Jesus did not come in as a gladiator, right? He came in, first of all, as a little baby in a manger, you know. And even when he was entering into Jerusalem um, on Palm Sunday or, you know, with a triumphal entry, you know, he wasn't coming in, you know, with a bunch of military, you know, outfits and whatnot, you know, and he wasn't coming in on a big horse. He was coming in on a colt. He was coming in humble, you know, and he, you know, he clearly wasn't coming in to, you know, start up some kind of revolt or revolution, you know, and so that was their issue. They wanted somebody to come in and basically right now just overthrow these Roman oppressors. Um, but, you know, that was not... Um, how Jesus was going to be coming into the world. And so, um, you know, the, the issue was, I guess, you know, they had read the scriptures and they had basically misinterpreted the scriptures. Um, they had done their own interpretation of the scriptures. And so when God sent Jesus and he didn't look the way that they expected him to look, um, you know, they kind of were just kind of set in their ways. Um, you know, Jesus was very clear about who he was. Um, you know, if you look, you know, throughout the gospel of Luke and, you know, the other gospels, he repeatedly explained what his purpose was and what his mission was. If you go to Luke 4, you know, when he was at Nazareth, you know, he told him to give him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And, you know, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, so he is talking about issues relating to salvation and deliverance, but it's not talking necessarily about some sort of military coup, right? You know, he's talking about salvation, meaning like being delivered from sin, you know, and then, you know, once, you, once you've got this salvation that allows you to be delivered from sin, then you could be delivered from some things that have had you bound, but that may not mean that you still don't have to pay the Romans taxes. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that, that kind of was the thing that they were kind of missing. Um, and then, you know, when he spoke with his disciples and he was talking with them, you know, uh, you may recall when he was talking with Peter to try to see, you know, after all of the time when they had been walking with them, with him, did they really understand, you know, who he was, you know? And he asked Peter, you know, well, you know, who, who do you say that I am? You know, and Peter did answer the Christ of God, you know, the Messiah of God. Um, you know, he told them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Well, again... That's a different kind of Messiah. That does not sound like the Messiah who's coming in just to kind of throw down and take over the world, right? So that's, again, not the kind of Messiah that these Jewish people have been looking for. And, you know, and then in Luke 9, 51, you know, he clearly, it clearly says he set his face toward Jerusalem. So he was always clear on what his purpose was, but they were rejecting of the Messiah that God had sent to them. You know, God was like, you know, this is, what you need, but, you know, when God sent them what they needed, you know, they didn't want it. And so Jesus was, that's why he was weeping, because it's like, you know, this is what, you know, what I have been planning to send you all this time, this is what I've promised you all this time, and now it's here, and you don't want it, you know, and, you know, it's such a tragedy. Um, you know, his purpose was 
uh, when he came to ultimately provide us with, again, salvation from our sins. Uh, to some extent, the problem was, you know, that some of the Jews were confusing the purpose of the Messiah's first coming with the purpose of the Messiah's second coming. You know, we talked earlier about that he's coming back. And so, as I was doing my study, apparently there are still some prophecies regarding the Messiah in Scripture that have not been fulfilled yet. And so part of the issue was the Jews had kind of mixed it all together, but he's coming back again. And so, you know, that when he comes back again, that's when the takeover is occurring. You know, but they got it confused, and they wanted all of it to happen at one time, you know. Um, you know, but before we become too hard on the first century Israelites, we need to remind ourselves that God always refuses to be confined within the narrow boxes that we may try to put him in regarding how we think that he's supposed to act, okay? In Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, God said his thoughts are above our thoughts, right? Um, so, you know, I have a few questions. If God doesn't do what we want him to do or tell him, tell us what we want to hear or give us what we think we're entitled to, how are we going to react? You know, how, how do we react? Do we have adult temper, temper tantrums? Yeah. You know, if God doesn't deliver us in the way or in the time frame that we're expecting, are we still going to believe in him? Amen? If God has even spoken a promise, if you've been praying to God about something and you've heard a yes in your spirit and he's spoken a promise over it, but it hasn't happened yet, amen? And there's been a delay in that thing. And it's been delayed so long that you're wondering, did you even hear him right? Are you really going to do it? You know? Okay? You know? And God forbid um, if what Jesus is doing doesn't line up with our agenda or how we think things should be done. What if Jesus is hanging out with and forgiving sinners or, God forbid, blessing them? Oh, my. You know, how are we going to respond? Are we going to leave the church? You know, so, you know, some of these things that we see these first century Jews doing, there are parallels. You know what I'm saying? When we kind of think in our mind and based on our little interpretations of Scripture that this is how it's supposed to be, and then God's doing something that's not quite what we thought, right? We need to sometimes check ourselves because it's possible that we may not have fully understood and interpreted things the right way. You know, and this is a clear example because some of them, you know, some of them were